Hallelujah. How about that? Here is Baptist Church. I've been gone three weeks, it seems like, for Sink and Edwards. So, how about some prayer requests this morning? Anybody have any particular? I'm not going to go through our big long list. Yes, Chuck. So, praying earnestly, fervently, intensely that there can be a strategy on the last, on September 28, uh, 28 to finally really enjoy the uh, men's prayer breakfast from beginning to end and then... No, no. I know you're upset we didn't have men's breakfast yesterday, but we actually said that way back in July that it was a holiday weekend and we weren't going to have it. Ah. Uh, we said it several times. I didn't hear uh, you. I don't know why you didn't. You were probably talking while I was talking. I don't uh, know. I don't think But it's okay. We're going to have it September 28th, uh -huh. and uh, we will then talk about whether we do October, because that's the same day as the Fall Festival, and so I think I need to chat with the man, but maybe we should make a reservation at a restaurant, because I'm sure they'll be working in here, and they won't want us to have a mess in there. Uh, and then we need to talk about whether the, the next one then would be the Thanksgiving weekend. That's why the announcement that will be rolling through during Sundays between Sundays going to church says most months. Because we need to talk about whether we want to have men's prayer on Thanksgiving. I don't need an answer right now, but you know, before the end of October we probably want to decide if we're going to have a uh, one in Afterwards, I can drive to Castellan, and even though part two not a real plane, but uh, a perfect uh, instrument panel like the uh, real Cessna, and uh, the only real scenery that is uh, on the flight some later in Castellan. Uh, yes, what's the name of the town? Castellan. Castellan. Yes. Not familiar with the town, but we will, we will pray that you get your UC assimilator in Costa Lounge on September 28th. Hello, Dave. Hello, Alex. Uh, anybody else have a prayer request? Go in one. Well, let me give you a couple of that, that are um, important to me. Jeff Alverson, who was the director of BIMI Missions, he's still pretty busy about the Lord's work. Uh, BIMI military missions, he was the director. He was the director when, when we came aboard. Uh, and then Brother Brian actually was approved to take his place the same meeting where we were approved to be military missionaries with BIMI. Anyway, uh, Jeff, uh, Air Force veteran, I don't think he's retired Air Force. But anyway, they found a uh, malignant tumor in his esophagus. And so they're going to run some other tests if it has spread through other places in his body before they come up with a sweet treatment plan. So let's pray for Brother Jeff, because like I say, that's, uh, uh, he's busy about the Lord's work, but uh, the Lord's in control. Let's pray about that. And two young people that I, I coached one of them, I taught them both, um, it seems like yesterday, but they're 31 today, they're twins. Uh, Katie Zach, Zach is uh, still with Stevenson. Katie is no longer with Stevenson, and I don't remember her married name because she didn't marry somebody from Smithson. But anyway, they were both dealing with blood clots. Uh, they're awfully young for dealing with that. He thought maybe he had plantar fasciitis, and he went to the doctor, and they did some tests, and they put him on some blood thinners and a, a boot to try to help the thing dissolve. Katie, on the other hand, is 30 or 31 weeks. Pregnant, and they've already amputated more than 
insert, they've already amputated her foot, and they're considering a through the knee amputation because of the difficulty. That might be distracting during Sunday school. If you want to stop that during Sunday school, go to the Oh. Um, I keep seeing people's heads flick over that way every time it changes, so it must be a distraction. But anyway, uh, she's the baby so far is doing well, but they're concerned about all the pain medicine she has to be on uh, for all these procedures. So anyway, let's pray for Katie and Zach. And uh, there was one other one. Um, a young, a young preacher. I won't give his name. blindsided oh in the last seven to ten days um, been married about 12 years has a young son and if I get too many details anybody listening in the states might figure out who it is so I'll stop there his wife just packed up took his kid took all his kids clothes and toys and you know put the always two sides or something, but as well as I know him, he seems legitimate, and he's like, I, I don't, I'm crushed, I had no idea, I didn't know there was a problem, and uh, she did agree to meet and talk with him someday this week uh, at a McDonald's so he could see his son, and when she first left, she told him he couldn't see him unless he came to the in-laws house. Anyway, so that, that, definitely change not only his life but the life of his child and the life of his wife but it could also end his ministry and so let's just let's just pray for that young man anybody else yes ma'am i have a phrase um our landlord um he's answer has permission is that what you call yes yes yeah ma'am. and he's but he's still going on a chemotherapy and also i another one i we prayed for this lady Last few day, uh, last session, um, uh, her name is Stephanie Borromeo. She was able to call me yesterday, and she seems to be giving herself to the Lord. And uh, but she still needs to learn more about the Bible, and also. Is she here local? No, she's in the states, and she just came to me and asked if she could join a prayer, my prayer group, <laughs> my prayer group, and. And she said, Jesus group. And I was like, oh, what does that even mean? I don't have anything, anyone. But I told her that I'm going to I'm gonna give you a call and I'm going to like try to pray for you and show you the Bible, and she, which she did. And uh, she was like crying and giving everything up. And, and she uh, we spent like two hours on the call. And she seems to know the Lord because she is very, uh, she's a nurse in the States. And um, she just had a very, Trouble, troubled marriage. And she got two children, and I told her that she needs to get right to the Lord because the children are the one that's gonna, you know, take all that. And she seems to be in a good spirit. I'm just gonna continue praying for her. Okay, well that's actually pretty exciting. Did you give a name or you didn't give a name? I gave, I gave a name. Steffi Bermeo. Steffi Bermeo. All right. Well, that's very encouraging. Not only that she's receiving. Uh, the witness, but that uh, you're giving it, amen, it's very encouraging. Anybody else? Oh, uh, one more thing. One more, all right, one more. And um, travel mercies for my husband, he should be here in this week. Like a week from tomorrow? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> he, never, he never really gave me a date, he's just saying, like, yeah, I'm going to be there.
crazy thing for uh, Alex's landlord there. We pray for uh, Doug as he's getting ready to cross the board. We thank you for the good word of Stephanie receiving and Alex giving a witness. Lord. We pray that you would have your perfect will there. We pray for um, Zach and Katie. Lord. We pray that you just uh, allow this oral medicine that uh, Zach is taking to dissolve the blood clot, Lord. We do pray for Katie's baby, that uh, it would remain strong in the midst of all these battles that she's fighting, Lord. And, uh, Lord, I appreciated Zach's request that you would raise him up so that he could be the man of his family, and especially for his widowed mother, and uh, continue his ministry there in the local school where he coaches, Lord. I just pray that you have your will there. Lord, we pray for <laughs> so, considering that your second language it really is something to brag about, actually, it's really probably your third language. But anyway, let's turn to Second Kings. We've already covered uh, the floating axe head. We covered that the uh, uh, the Syrian king felt like somebody within his crown was um, uh, a, a, a double agent, if you will, and sharing back with. Uh, uh, Israel, what was going on, and his own people said, no, nope, no, nope, it's not one of us, Lord, it's a, a king, it is Elisha. And, uh, of course, uh, I believe we covered the fact where uh, uh, he tried to, to do away with Elisha. Uh, let's pick up here in verse 24 of chapter 6. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, besieged is a military term, so we got a bunch of military guys in the room. Tell me what it is to besiege. Overtake. All right, so I, I heard Alex say something. I didn't quite make it. And then I heard you, and then I heard you, and then I heard So what did you say? I'll conquer. To conquer, she said. Afraid? Attack. Attack? Yeah. Attacking force. Overtake by force. Overtake by force. So, all of those are probably accurate, but when I think of a seed, anybody else got something they want to say? Yeah, you surround it. You're, I'm like, with a seed, you're completely <laughs> surrounded, all right? And so you're cutting off all, there's no supply line. That's one of the ways that people... Like, like successful military leaders often win battles and actually win wars by cutting off the supply line. 
you know, I think it was Napoleon that said, but some leader of, of days gone by said, an army can't go but on its belly. In other words, if they're hungry, they can't fight well. So if you cut off the supplies, and that's what the siege is, it's, it is an attack, they are trying to conquer, but it is, they're completely surrounded. All right, let's continue reading. There was a great famine in Samaria. And, and so, let me just stop one more time. I don't, I don't think this was just a siege of the city of Samaria. That Samaria is also a term synonymously for the ten tribes. Okay? So he's kind of cut them all off. Alright? So let's keep reading. There was a great famine in Samaria. Behold, they besieged it until an ass's head sold was sold for four score pieces of silver. So 80 pieces of silver. Now, I've, I've never seen anybody eat a donkey's head. All right? Now, I've actually seen people. first place I saw it was in Iceland. But I've seen people all over the world eat a sheep's head. Okay? Uh, my dad ate what was called, I, I had to eat it, to be honest with you. I kind of liked it. I will tell you if you ever buy it, don't put it in a microwave, it disappears. But uh, what, what some people call hog's head cheese, which is basically just, my daddy called it souse meat. I don't know where that term comes from either, but uh, it's basically the way they take all this stuff, they boil it together, and then they make a uh, loaf out of it like bologna or something. Anyway, it's good eating, but... Uh, I wouldn't pay 80 pieces of silver for it, all right? <laughs> and the fourth part of a calf of a dove's dung, I have no idea how much a calf is, but five pieces, so, so five pieces of silver for some feces, some refuse. If you think that's impossible, I mean, I guess you're pretty hungry. As for, as, and as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall there, cried a woman unto him, Help me, my Lord, help my Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Now this king is not a good king. He's an Israeli king. And the, the tribe of Israel never had, I mean, you know, the, the ten northern tribes never had a good king. Okay, this guy is very much like his grandfather Ahab. But he did have enough sense that the Lord doesn't help you, I can't help you. But uh, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him day to day. Eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Now you're pretty hungry when you eat your own child. I have never known anybody or any animal, for that matter, that was that hungry. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall. The people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. And then he said, Now, now he, he's upset about that, right? That's a good thing. Because there's wickedness going on. And he's torn his clothes, which is uh, the sign of, of sorrow, of, of weeping and so forth. But it's not a good thing because it doesn't matter how sorry you are. Like Alex mentioned the, the young lady she was talking to crying. Well, well crying can be a good thing, all right? I, I'm not judging whether that woman was crying in the right way or not because I'm not a part of the conversation. But crying is not always the solution. You've probably seen people, I've seen people that were crying a lot, but they would not come to, to the position that God would have them come for. God allows this. We see it over and over in the Scripture. God allows these difficult times in order to turn us to Him. If we're His own people, we can kind of get cold and back away from Him some. If we're lost, He still sometimes allows difficulties to bring us to Him. He allows difficulties to bring the saved back into a right relationship with him. He's basically giving you the opportunity to pray by the difficulties that we face, all right? And it's very similar with lost people. But 
this is not a good cry because look where he puts the blame. God do so and more also to me if the head of Elijah, the son of Shaphat, shall stand upon him this day. So, he's again, he's doing like his grandfather or maybe great-grandfather, Ahab, when Ahab, you remember, Elijah the Tishbite, this country preacher, shows up in the king's court and he says, hey, Y'all ain't living right. It's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then he disappears. It doesn't rain for three years. And the Lord tells Elijah after a period of time to go find Ahab. And when they meet, Ahab says, Ah, here is he that troubled Israel. He blamed Elijah and not himself and his sin. And that's what the, the, the great grandson or grandson whatever it may be, is doing here. He's blame, basically blaming God's man, not the sin. We reap what we sow. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. All ten of these northern terms continue to sow to the flesh no matter what God did. So I think we can see that today. A lot of times, we as Christians, we get upset about what we see in the world, but we don't allow it to change us. We don't allow him to turn us to Christ like he wants us to turn to Christ. Or, I don't know which one's worse, Fred, not allowing him to change us or allowing him to change us in the wrong direction. Sometimes we become arrogant in the midst of these trials that we're so much better than these other people because, well, I'm not a trans. I'm not involved in homosexuality. I'm not involved in drugs. I'm not cheating on my wife. I don't look at pornography. Fill in the blank. And so then we, 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 become, we become very pharisaical. Oh, Lord, I thank thee that I am not like this man. Right? I mean, come on. Those of you, the, but what God wants us to do is to humble, pray, seek, and turn, right? Hmm. So there's always a lesson in these history here. This is one of the books of history. Verse 32, But Elijah sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. The king sent a man before him, but ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Elijah said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? So God allowed Elijah somehow to know that this king was sending somebody to kill him. Whether that just be discernment or a specific particular prophecy, I don't know. Excuse me. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, hold him fast at the door. It is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he yet talked with him, behold, the messenger came down unto him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria. Now, we just read in my Bible, the verses are almost parallel, side by side there, that a donkey's head is 80 pieces of silver, and some portion of a dove's refuse is five pieces of silver. And in the shekel, that's a much smaller, it's like saying for a nickel or even a penny, maybe, all right? Much smaller piece of money that tomorrow you're going to be able to buy the fine flour. Then the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? So what is that? What's he saying there? If the Lord made windows in heaven, might this thing be? What's he saying? I'm sorry, I can hear you. Was she thinking that it's the impossible? Impossible. That is exactly what he's thinking. I don't think he's mocking God, though that's possible. I think he's maybe mocking the prophet. If God opened the windows of heaven, is this possible? Look how bad it is today. And you say it's tomorrow. And this is what I try to keep get people to see. As we look at the situation rather than looking at the Savior, and we say, it's gone. I mean, I'm sick. I'm sorry. It's 
Sunday school time, and I should be teaching, but as I'm preaching, I'm sick and tired of people saying it's too late. If we're breathing and God's living, the Bible says He inhabits eternity, then it's not too late. This is not a revival, what we're reading about here. But we read of a revival in, I believe it was Hezekiah's day, for 150 years. Fred, in my, in my mind, we're just looking at, at 40 to at the most 70 years of debauchery in the United States. And it's really kind of taken off in the last 15 years. In the scriptures, we read... I preached through where in Hezekiah's day, 150 years of stuff like, very much like what we're dealing with. All the same stuff, all the trans, all the sodomy, the pedophilia, all this crazy stuff that's going on in the world. It was going on then, and the Bible says, suddenly, God did a word, suddenly, because one person turned, and then other people turned with him. It started with one person and suddenly spread throughout the land. Basically, this is how it is. While I was home, I preached roughly the same message nine times. All right? Eight times. Once I preached a totally different message when I was in a Christian school chapel. But anyway, I tried to come at it from a different direction so that it wasn't, you know, totally boring for my uh, wife and kids who were with me. Uh, but I basically preached the same sermon, the sermon on... on 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which is like, if you take the 250-page uh, dissertation I wrote, that's like beef jerky. It's like dissertation jerky, okay? It's 250 pages into one term. Anyway, I won't say that it was every time, <coughs> but nearly every time I preached it. One or more people came to me afterwards and basically said, can't happen. Now, this is something I said every sermon, again. If you think it can't happen, it won't happen. That's not my opinion. That's Bible. As a man thinks it has heart, so is he. If you see yourself as a drunkard, you're always going to be a drunkard. If you see yourself, if you see yourself as anything, that's probably what's going to come to pass. People that, that there's a, I would not dare quote him, and I can't think of his name because he's got a really foul mouth. But there's a guy who wanted to join the Navy Seals. He's a, I believe he's of African American descent, but that's irrelevant to the story. Anyway, he uh, when he went to talk to the recruiter about joining, they just they just told him straight up, "You're too fat. You can't do it." He just went home and said, "I'm I'm going to." And that's a little different than a revival, but in a revival situation, we have to determine we're going to put ourselves in a position where God can bless. I'm going to hoist that sail of humility to catch the winds of revival. I'm going to hoist that sail of prayer to catch the winds of revival. But in his case, he just went home. He worked at it. The guy's retired, I think, now. He's probably in his 40s, and he still runs ridiculous amounts of distances and competes in all these competitions because he's like, you have to see yourself accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Uh, and there, there are several... Actually, I think most of the ones I'm thinking of are all Navy SEALs uh, who, who encourage people to that. But, I mean, I'm telling you, if we sit here and we don't believe God's going to send a revival, it's very likely that he don't because it's not because he can't feel, but it's because if we see it that way, then we won't put ourselves in a position to catch the winds of revival when they blow. Now, when I read, you're going to see if God wants to do a work, he's going to do a work. All right? <laughs> Let's keep going. So the, the, the man doesn't believe it, and the life answers, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Hmm. You're gonna see, you're gonna see what's gonna happen, 
but you can't you can't you can't eat the goodness thereof. Now there were four lepers then at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Then we say we will if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they were at the uttermost part, we're going to stop there for just a second. Isn't that where we are today? And I think we'll see more that we're there when we get a little further into the story. But we just sit here, and if we go this way, there, there, are, there are things going on maybe to our left theologically, but if we go over there, well, we're just going to die because there's, God's not working over there. If we sit where we are and we don't voice those cells, we don't try to see revival, then we're just not going to see revival. When I try to go to where God's working, all right, now that's not exactly what's happening there, but their idea is, you know what, if we do here, the worst thing can happen is we're only going to die. We have leprosy. We're going to die anyway. It's just going to be quicker if we go over there. Now, let's keep reading. They got there and said, Behold, there was no man there. For the Lord hath made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for life. And when those lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried in silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried in also and went and hid it. And then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry to the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore, the, come that we may go and tell the king's household. We do not well. There's a sermon there as well. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ, and yet we allow one fear or another to keep us from sharing it with other people. That is not doing well. It's not doing well. So the lepers went. Now they, they were just like us, you know, boy. One well, except I don't have leprosy in me. But you know, when you find a blessing, it's kind of hard to think about other people at first, you know. Uh, I can see them running in one one. Uh, tent and getting a new shirt and running another tent. Oh, these pants fit this well, and you got this gold and this silver and all this grub. But thank God, eventually somebody said, Hey, the people of Israel are dying over here. The people all around us are dying. We got to give them the gospel. We have something that is, you know, in, in the letters to. Churches in Revelation. One of them, it might be Smyrna. I'm not going to take time to flip over there and read through it to make sure it's Smyrna. Anyway, one of them. God basically says, I know your poverty, and yet you're rich. Amen. How are they rich? These guys are dying of leprosy. But they were rich in food and garments and money and these sorts of things, and they decided to share it. How none of us ever, I have never met a person who considers themselves wealthy. I haven't. Everybody considers themselves middle class. Okay? Now, maybe you met somebody, and I've never met anybody like Bill Gates that kind of money, but I've met some millionaires, and yet they still don't see themselves as, as wealthy. All right? How are we wealthy? If you're a child of the king, he has a cow on a thousand hills. Wealth in every line. Um, we are children of the king of kings, David. Exactly. Our father created everything. And the Bible says that he owns the earth and the fullness thereof are his. The cow on a thousand hills, that's also a phrase from scripture about what God owns, but there's another that says the earth and the fullness thereof are his, okay? We're children of the king. We need to share this with other people. I'm going to try to finish this chapter, but it's high in my life. So they came and called us to the porter of the city, and they 
came to the camp of Syria, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the point. Now, just sit in this for a second. It sounds a lot like a horror movie to me, in that why would running away, you're going to run away, Brother Beasley, but you're not going to run away in your car. The donkeys, the horses, and so forth, that's their, that's their mode of transportation. But only God could have been in it for them to run away on foot instead of mounting up and riding away. But uh, anyway, sounds like, you know, the horror movie. I think it's a guy show commercial where the guy hides. But don't get in the running car. Go hide by the chainsaw, you know. Anyway. He called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will not show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field. And when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of the servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are all as the multitude of Israel that are left in. In other words, the horses are dying too. I say they are even as the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. And they took, therefore, two chariot horses. And the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. They went after them unto Jordan. And lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned. And told the king, the people went out to spoil the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. The people chose upon him. So this is the guy that uh, told Elijah he couldn't handle. People trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. Do you understand that he trod, they trod upon him? They trampled him. Once when it seems crazy to me that somebody could be trampled to death by other humans. We're not dumb beasts. But it happened. You probably, soccer fans, can remember sometime it's happened. I'm, I'm positive there's a faint glint of it at one of these crazy soccer games somewhere in Europe or the Middle East where they, they left in a hurry and someone was chosen to death. But y'all know I like to read, especially historical stuff. And I know Spurgeon was preaching once and somebody hollered fire in a building that was really packed above capacity. There were nearly 25,000 people in the building. And they, they say it was a, a trick that pickpocketers would use because in the rush to get away, then it was easy picking to get in people's money. But several people died in the rush to get out of the building because they were stomped to death. They were trampled to death. And that's what happened to this guy because of his unbelief. And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of uh, fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time they gave it to Mary, that the Lord answered the man of God and said, Now the Lord, the Lord should make the windows of heaven. Uh, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it, and thou shalt not, shall not eat thereof. And so it fell upon him, for the people told him in the gate that he died. We are going to stop there, even though it's a little early. If I get into chapter 8, I will be there. So, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? That it means you were bored to death or it's a good lesson, and I'll let you decide which one. Uh, Jeremy, would you close this in prayer? Well. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you, just uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, just uh, John and his family being back, Lord. Just thank you for this uh, Sunday school message, Lord, just uh, helping us grow and uh, and and see, Lord, that uh, that you, in fact, will open those windows for us, Lord, and just be able to, uh, uh, Lord, just take care of us, Lord. Just thank you so much for uh, loving us and just being with us, Lord. Just uh, I just pray that you'll just be with John as he brings the next hour, Lord, and just uh, 
and open our hearts, Lord, so we can hear you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.